of planning and preparation. So wall hunting, I know I mentioned this before, but how to select the wall, how to select that site where the mural is going to be. Sometimes the project that you're applying for, the RFQ, the RFP tells you exactly where the location is going to be, and you don't have to do any of this work. But sometimes you do. And like I said, I like to have a list already of potential walls, walls that are great. Um, but things that you might ask uh, when you find these, these walls are who owns the building or the site? Are they local? Uh, and will they be willing to sign a wall authorization form? Um, I have my own little document um, and it's just a wall authorization agreement. I have one here. Um, and it's really there to, to protect you um, and to keep some things in mind. And I'll go over some of these things in a second, but knowing who owns the building, who is the real owner of that building, um, and are they local? Why? I've come across where, yes, you have my permission to do a mural on the wall. I'll sign the wall authorization form, but that's a property. I don't live there. And then you, it's really hard to keep track of, of the owner. And you, you have to have that open communication with them because it's their property. There are contracts to sign. They most probably will have want to, want to have input on the mural design too. So um, having it be a local person is, is very important to me. Um, also, one thing that sometimes we don't think about is that if who owns the property next to it, if I'm going to be installing and I need to put scaffolding on the lot next to it, who owns that property and will they, uh, they allow me in the property? Um, whose permission do we need? So consider speaking with as many residents and community members, business owners uh, that might be impacted by uh, the creation of, of the mural. Now, it might create traffic. They might not want the traffic. They might want the traffic. Uh, so what are really the benefits of, of this mural? And keep all those little things in mind. Who is your targeted audience? Okay, so let's just say that um, I want to target, like I want children to have input in this mural, um, school students, um, but I'm in a business district. There's no schools around here. So that means I'm in the wrong um, area, right? So keep your audience in mind. What are the narrative, the message, and cultural values we're hoping to communicate? So are there other opportunities around that site, other community organizations that we might be able to connect with uh, that might have input in the mural, that might want to participate in community days, uh, in design um, uh, classes, or, or anything that I, how much can we benefit from this mural? How much can we share with the community? Um, so those are things to think about, to identify different uh, possible partnerships. Um, also, who would be responsible for upkeeping, for cleaning, damage repair if necessary? Will it be the wall owner? Will it be the artist? Will it be an organization who takes care of the lot? Um, so think of all those things. Um, usually when it's a community project, like I mentioned before, if there's a lot of littering, if there's a garden next to it that needs upkeep, um, the community will really take ownership and, 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 uh, contribute to that. Um, also one thing to keep in mind is how much exposure, sun exposure does the side get? So murals fade over time, even with the quali highest quality paint, whatever varnish you use to seal or the uh, sealant. Um, the more sun exposure the mural receives, the colors will fade quicker. So uh, another thing to consider is if it's inside the building, who has access to the building? Um, when you're going to be painting, uh, you're going to have need access to the site. So if you're in a business that is open nine to five and you don't want to be in the sun, you want to actually paint at night or you need to project at night, who's going to leave that site open? Who will be there? Is there security? Um, so just keeping all those things in mind, think of every possible thing that could come up so that since the beginning from those initial meetings, it's, it's sorted through. So important questions to ask a property owner is, does the wall need any repairs and who's going to be responsible for that? Uh, sometimes the building owners say, I'll take care of it. I'll even prime the wall for you. I really want this mural. And that's really the great... <laughs> 
<laughs> the greatest expectation you could have. Uh, but then sometimes there are people that are very hesitant uh, and or don't know how to do these things or are not able to. And you have, uh, if you want the work to happen, then you have to really jump in and do it. Um, so who will prep the surface? Uh, who's going to clean the surface? Who's going to prime the surface? Uh, and then insurance and responsibilities. Um, if you're going to be obstructing the sidewalk, like what permits do you need? Um, who's responsible for maintaining the mural afterwards, after, after it's completed? Um, all things to keep in mind. Um, but when, when I'm wall hunting, this is the list of things that I have in the back of my head of back of my mind of what I should be looking for. All right. So first and most importantly is the size of the wall. Is it visible? Do I need special equipment such as scaffolding or a lift? Now, when you're thinking budget, scaffolding and lift are a big part of that budget, especially if, uh, you're going to need it for, for a long time. All right. If you need to rent it for a month, you're talking thousands of dollars. Um, am I able to use a lift or scaffolding? Are the ground conditions safe? Uh, the best, best wall that you can think of is just a clean, smooth stucco. That is the ideal wall. Um, best walls are made out of brick, plaster, concrete, or signboard. The worst types of surfaces are unsealed wood and aluminum. Um, inspect the wall for cracks and severe water damage. That is, if I see water damage, I, I, I stay away. <laughs> um, sun exposure. So having a north facing wall is ideal. Uh, walls that have directional traffic and walls where people congregate, such as parks, um, and always practice due diligence. And I'm going to show you a couple of samples of these walls. So this is a wall, uh, that I collaborated with two other artists, uh, for a mural here this is a clean smooth stucco is it's ideal you see the cement the concrete is smooth um you don't see any water damage um it, it really is when i was doing this it looked like the perfect wall for me and you'll see why i say <laughs> where i say that so this is the next image this is the mural it already went up uh, and you can see some water damage right there this was a mural that was not intended to last very long um, this is, uh, a photography printed in paper, um, and attached to the wall. So we knew that it wasn't going to last that long, but, uh, you can see, this is a perfect example of what water damage can do to murals. So inspect the wall for cracks or severe damage. You want to find the wall that has the conditions that give you the most lifespan of the mural. Um, if there's minor cracks, those are usually sealed with paint and that's fine, but keep a good eye, keep a look for um, cracks that go from up down uh, because those are more of, of water damage. Um, we want the lifespan of the mural to be between 50 to 20 years, depending on the materials that you use. So this is another example of, of a wall. Um, so when the wall faces south, um, I like to protect the surface using an MSA, a mineral spirit acrylic varnish that can act almost as a sunblock uh, for your mural. So it helps hold up the colors that together with using high quality acrylic paint um, will make your mural last for many, many more years. Um, but like I said before, I try to choose a north facing wall. But if that's not possible, just using the correct varnish, the right protection for your wall will uh, prevent those colors from fading. This is a wall where um, it's just a perfect wall. It's just brick wall. Um, it's smooth and it's in good condition. There's nothing really uh, obstructing the wall there. This is a wall. Well, you can see on the ceiling that there's a water drain right there. So I knew already when I was designing for this mural that that was going to obstruct the view. So just uh, keep in mind um, that sometimes you have to incorporate these things into the design. Um, in this wall, I also want to know that there's an incline in the bottom. All right. So those are all things to look for when you're measuring for your mural. Now, when measuring is happening, <laughs> it is very, very important for you, for, uh, you to do it a couple of different times using different rulers, with different measuring tapes. It's happened to me when I've used two different measuring tapes in the project and there is, um, 
a discrepancy in measurements. Um, so do it a couple of times. I say you can ask somebody else to help you do this, but I've learned from my mistakes and I do it myself and I do it a couple of times uh, because measurements are very, very important when designing your mural. So the, try to find walls that get the directional traffic. This is what I was talking about before so that it can be seen um, from different points of view. Um, walls that are visible to pedestrians, ideally corners, uh, where you can get multiple viewpoints is, is really a plus. So this is a mural that is above ground and underground. Uh, it's on the bottom of a hill you can see, but it's in a school um, and a major intersection. Um, and students walk around this whole um, block um, a couple of times a day. So this was excellent visibility. Now, not the greatest. Um, let me see if I have an image next to it. Not the greatest um, in obstructions. I have windows, I have a railing, I have a trash can <laughs> there, uh, a big trash bin. Um, so they were not ideal, but really pros and cons and the benefits of, of the, the visibility of this wall really, um, I, I, I had to take this wall. Um, so let me move to the next slide so you can see. So um, the other thing that I mentioned was to always do your due diligence and uh, figure out what's what's happening and that log, what's happening to the wall. Um, talk to your neighbors, talk to community members, talk to city council to make sure that there is no impending future development happening on the side or adjacent to that lot, that the building's not gonna be sold, or if it is, then in your contract, make sure that it's outlined what happens if the building is sold, all right? You don't want that to happen, but it could happen. Uh, so just make sure you outline what's gonna happen if there's a new owner of the wall. How long is the mural gonna be taken down or is it, it will it continue there? Um, so really think of those things. So this is the final mural that I showed you that had the water damage later. So this is when it looked great. Um, and then this happened a couple of years after. <laughs> so construction happened, development happened. This is a few years ago. Now I believe there is a building right next to it. So there is no visibility at all of this mural. You can also see how uh, the damage in the photograph right now. Um, this was sealed correctly and everything, but like I said, it's paper and there was water damage on the back of that wall. So things to keep in mind. Um, ask as many questions as you can. So this is that wall again uh, that had the perfect visibility. This is just to show you that sometimes you might find some trees blocking part of the view. So what I suggest is to work those things into the design of, of your mural. Um, maybe there's not a lot of detail behind the area where the trees are, or um, you have to take into consideration that trees are gonna keep growing. Do not remove the trees, leave them there, but uh, keep those into consideration. And then also any obstructions. Um, for example, in this wall, I knew I had um, aluminum siding on this wall, water drains, a sign that's not being used. Um, so how could I incorporate that into the design? So in this specific wall, I had um, to take a risk. Um, and these are things to keep in mind. So what happens do I incorporate that uh, that sign that's not being used into the design or do I remove it, all right? If I remove it, I don't know what's going to be behind it. I don't know if there's more damage. Do I have the money and the budget to deal with whatever is behind that sign? So that's why that contingency um, money is important when you're doing your mural budget. So those are just a few samples of walls. And a, a couple of things that I think of when I'm doing this is the strength, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the constraints of those walls. Um, I carry with me, and I'll show you a second, um, a mural wall evaluation form that looks like this. And this is going to be part of the toolkit, um, so you can fill these out. It includes everything from basic information about the project name, the artist, the wall, um, the wall owner, um, contact information for all of those, but really your project budget, the lifespan of the project, what mural medium are you going to be using, which we'll cover next. Um, is the building a residence, a business, industrial, a school? 
who's your side contact information there? It could, and maybe it's not the business owner, maybe it's a school. So having that uh, contact information with you at all times is, is important. Evaluating the surface, I mentioned stucco, brick, cement, taking note of all those things, and then describing these things. If you see water damage, could you deal with that? Could, could, do you need to have an expert come and look at it and repair that first? How much is that gonna cost? So um, scaffolding, for example, are you gonna need it? What kind of scaffolding um, do you need? Um, really a lot of very good information here uh, that is important to have um, so that you can have that final assessment of the wall. Um, and if you have any recommendations for other walls too. So um, think about who sees the wall, what is great about the wall, what is challenging about the wall, what are the unique opportunities of these, this wall, um, and then the limitations of that project. Um, and then very important, do not move forward if you don't have that wall authorization form signed, all right? So secure that permission and consent. So who uh, owns the wall? It could be private or it could be a public owned uh, wall or building. Uh, so in both cases, the same rules apply. You need to contact the owner, get a written agreement of the, for the mural, including the proposed theme or topic for the mural, the lifespan of the mural, and who will be responsible for the maintenance. And if there is a decommission pro decommissioning process, then that should be outlined too. So, um, and then like I mentioned before, what happens if uh, the mural site that you chose is, is sold? What happens to, to the mural? So talk, talk, talk to the owner, make sure you outline it in the contract um, and really how much input is the owner of the wall gonna have on the mural design? I think that's where one very important thing. I've, I've, I've had some to take some difficult decisions on a mural theme a couple of times. Uh, and like I said, listen, listen and then compromise um, and find that common ground. Um, they Usually it's the same thing as the business owner, the owner of the wall wants that mural. So they really are gonna um, cooperate with you to make this happen. Um, and then the budget. So. A common concern with projects is the budget, the money. Where does it come from? Where am I getting it? How much am I getting it? Who's paying for it? When is it coming? <laughs> uh, so all of those things outlined in the contract. Um, the main um, um, portion of, of that budget should go to the artist fees and buying quite uh, high quality paint. These are the two things that I would not... Uh, that I would not uh, put down. Like uh, this, the, the most money of that budget should go to these two things. Do not compromise those two things. Um, so artist fees, including the planning, the designing, the research, the painting, and the installing of the mural. Um, th at the beginning, I would just think, oh, I'm just gonna paint the mural and, and that'll be it. Those are my painting hours. But no, like there's a lot of research. Go to the site, take pictures. Um, a lot of Photoshop or illustration designing, um, a lot of maybe just doing handwork too, um, drawing and painting, coming up with ideas, interviewing community community members, um, really all that planning and that research, make sure you include it in your lot enough hours of that. Um, and then mural equipment materials such as primer, paint, sealer, um, Equipment and storage, transportation, rental. I've forgotten that one before and I need to rent a U-Haul. I Now I go really into detail. <laughs> so I'm really OCD and I go into re detail about like how many miles am I going to travel? How much is the insurance going to cost for the rental? I include all those things in there. Um, publicity. Sometimes uh, the organization that you're working with might take care of that. Uh, but talk it out and figure out if you're going to need any of that, if it's going to be on your webpage, if you're going to make posts about it, if you need to hire a photographer, all those things to keep in mind. Um, wall preparation, permit fees, and then very important, your liability insurance. Um, th that's a no-brainer. So do not cut cost on that either. Um, and then the design. So... Um, so the first thing that I like to do is to investigate, to look uh, at how the place for the mural works compositionally with the environment. Um, I want it to be part of the environment. Do I want it to stand out of the environment? Does it look like it belongs there? 
Um, so consider also the demographics. You want to be able to communicate with that community um, and the multiplicity of aesthetics and perspectives of the neighborhood. Sometimes the theme of the mural, um, sorry, sometimes the theme for a mural, the site where it will be installed in the budget are known from the beginning. Sometimes only one of those things or two of those things are, are known from the beginning. So uh, dedicate more time to planning and to researching those things. Um, talk to the, the project manager, talk to uh, the business owner, uh, who, where the funding is coming from so that you know your limitations and you can be a realist, realistic and honest with yourself. Um, I mentioned before, don't always say yes to projects. If it's not going to work within the budget uh, and you are going to be stretched out thin trying to paint this mural and complete it, um, if there are things in your life happening at that moment, learn, learn to say no um, and to just move on to the next opportunity. Uh, but also talking to community members to get a sense of what is important to them and then investigate any social or civic concerns, political, historical needs from the community. Those are the murals that are, are really powerful, that are most significant when it's able to speak to the surrounding community. And then select the theme. So um, th this can happen in different ways. It might be that the theme is already given to you from the beginning. It could also be that there's a community that's going to select the theme. Or it might be that you as an artist have artistic freedom, which is the best, and you decide what the theme is going to be. But a couple of things to keep in mind is uh, what are some possible themes for that mural? Make a list of five words that could describe that mural. What images would reflect that theme? Are they representational of that? Uh, what colors really communicate? What color palette are you going to be using? Um, does that theme have significance to the community at large? Not only personal meaning. So you might think, oh, this work of art that I did, it's going to look great here. But does it really communicate uh, to the community at large? Um, I don't know how many times I can say this, but research, research, and research, lots of research. Uh, and a lot, a lot of this, uh, this, these hours into your budget. Um, really dive in into the community and research as much as you can, especially if you're doing like rest representational work. Uh, how are you going to be able to um, translate uh, the artwork, to translate, to be able to communicate the message that you're trying to, to relay? So when you're designing, you're imagining, you're defining, and then you're designing. So where are you starting from? What do we know now? What difference do you think you can make? Define what have you determined are the artistic components and is there a civic or social concern at the center of the project? What are the desired outcomes? When I look at the mural, yes, I can paint something that is going to beautify the community. But really, when you think about civic or social concerns that can be addressed, that you have the potential to address one of these things so that the community can benefit from it, then that it's a lot of responsibility for the artist, but um, you can't pass that opportunity, okay? You can make something beautiful, but you can also make something beautiful and significant. Um, and then designing. So how can art and engagement activities be linked together? How will you tap the power of the art to foster engagement or dialogue? How will you assess your impact? So um, community, that's the clue word right here. These engagements, finding the right partnerships uh, in that community is going to make your project a successful one. So some tips to keep in mind. Uh, so how will the mural be viewed? Will it be seen straight on? This is more of the physical qualities of the mural. Uh, would it be viewed from the side or straight on? Or will it look from perspective? How will it be seen from a moving car? Um, so when working with other artists, also consider their views and their aesthetics. Uh, how will you be able to incorporate those things? So take also into account the scale. How far away are people going to view this mural from? How much detail do you need to put onto these, these elements of the mural? Um, is the image accessible to all? Does it communicate to everyone? Is it understood? Is it legible? Uh, does it restore the community? Does it have historical roots, uh, contemporary culture, and just making sure that you're getting the information that you're putting in that mural from the correct sources? Um, 
what is considered advertisement. I learned that one the bad way. So um, for, for uh, I was making a mural that uh, said, welcome to the arts district. And that mural was on an art store. So when are these things considered advertisement if the text in the mural has the word art and is on an art store? Uh, is it an advertisement? Who do you ask these things? If you have a project manager, they can help you with that. But if not, if you're your own project manager, then research, contact the city to make sure uh, that you're doing things the right way. That if you need permits, then permits need to be um, paid for. Uh, but if not, then if you don't have it in the budget, then how can you work around these things? All right, so that you make sure you're not advertising something. Um, and then, um, when I start designing, I like to use Adobe Photoshop or Illustrator. I, I, I do a bunch of hand drawings, uh, paintings. I look for images. I redraw. And then I photograph. I scan. And then I put them into Photoshop. And I play around with the design. Um, so make as many sketches as you can. And then you're going to present the this design um, to a committee, to a mural committee for feedback. And make revisions if needed uh, until the design is approved. So um, this is the mural I was talking about. So um, this is Welcome to the Arts District Houston, and it's in um, on an art store. Uh, so um, really researching if um, if you needed permits for something like this. Um, the next thing, this is just a picture of me. This is all, you can see the black and white image is our drawings from students that are just placed one uh, next to the other. These are just images of uh, their drawings of the community. And then the actual painting of that part of the mural um, with that collaboration from the students. So this content design meeting, uh, the, these meetings are um, very helpful but I'm always an, so nervous for these meetings because you're presenting a lot of work that you did, a lot of research. You've put so many hours into it, um, but be prepared. Um, make sure that uh, you have full knowledge of what you have made and that you can be accountable for every, images, every imagery that's presented. Um, I like to bring an assistant or a friend or someone to help me take notes because I like to be really present and listen. Um, the committee might be building owner, project manager, community members, uh, it, other artists, um, as many feedback as you get. Uh, we tend as artists to design and really get into it and just focus on that. And then it, we need to take a moment to kind of step back and look at it and see, is, is the message really coming through? Um, so having um, the feedback from, from people that you respect and people that are gonna be viewing this, this mural is very, very important. Um, so they're going to give you feedback, read it, write it down, everything, and then go back, um, and, and work with those, those, um, the advice that they have given you. Also in that meeting, I like to set up the date for the final design approval. Um, so then you go home, you adjust the feedback according to the feedback, and then, uh, you go back on that day and, hopefully the final design is approved. Sometimes it's an in-person meeting. Sometimes it's just emailing the design again and having it get approved. But like I said before, I, I prefer, I personally prefer having just, just two meetings, the, the initial concept design meeting and then the final one. Um, for that final one uh, or for the, the concept meeting, I, you bring a rendition of, of the mural, like what it's the almost there uh, design. So on the top image right here, you have a rendition of the mural. And then in the bottom image, you have the actual mural. So um, sometimes having a picture of the building, and then I ha I like to have the original rendition, just the image by itself, but then also placing it using Photoshop on the actual building. So they get a better idea of what the mural is going to look like. And then for wall preparation, all right? So they approve the mural, you're ready to go. The next thing you need to do is uh, prepare the wall, okay? So ensure that the humidity and the temperature are appropriate for the installation material. Always read labels, very important. Um, I'm gonna give you temperatures according to what I, what I look for, but I always still read labels of any new product that I start using. Um, cleaning the wall as well as scraping any chips to establish that smooth surface before applying any paint. 
any small cracks will be covered with paint would be sealed and it's fine but keep a good look for those bigger cracks that move from top to bottom because there's usually seepage um water seepage there so we don't want that problem so address it before it becomes a problem um if the surface is already painted look at what they used to paint it if it's scraping off then you might need to sand the wall and then prime again um but look at what they used if it's if the paint is a water-based polymer and the the wall has been painted recently and it looks it looks good then it, it is going to have good adhesion with the the, the paint that you're going to apply over it uh, but if it's a high gloss paint it's not it's not going to work and so you might have to um a lot more hours in in your wall preparation uh, budget um to get those things taken care of um, and then I like to power wash the wall to remove any loose dirt and materials prior to painting. Allow it to dry before, um, before you prime your wall. A couple other things that sometimes we don't think about and I like to keep in mind is really being prepared. Um, any health and safety precautions that we might need to take. Um, so walk the site, make sure there's I've been in some in some neighborhoods where there, there's needles on the ground and you need to clear it. There's there's bottles, there's glass. So make sure that you, you clean the entire site, uh, that the artists are familiar with the required materials, not just yourself, but also if you have any assistants or volunteers, um, make sure that they're using protective equipment. If you're using a lift, having a hard hat, harnesses, whatever is required, do not skip any step on the um, safety is, is really important. Uh, so what happens if you're injured, you spill paint, the weather, have a plan for each and one of these things. Um, I have um, those orange traffic cones to kind of keep um, safety area. Um, I like to bring wet paint uh, signs uh, so that people don't touch the painting when it's still wet. Um, if you're working about nine feet, then you might need a ladder, scaffolding, uh, or lifts. Um, just make sure you, link, you look into the safety. I know it depends by state. You might need to have training on how to use a lift. So just, just do this with time uh, so that you're not ready to prime the wall and you realize that you have to go take a six hour course on how to drive a lift. Um, so look into those things. Uh, traffic management, if there's going to be traffic, how are you going to keep yourself safe, assistants or volunteers? Um, and then storing things like if you have paint thinner, if you have paint, where are you going to store these things? Access to water, access to first aid kit. Um, so what happens if it rains, you know, do you have a little tent or something to protect you? How, um, have, have everything ready, really be prepared for anything. Um, so those are just a few things that I've, I've added to my list of things to never forget. Um, and then you get to prime the wall. So when painting on brick on concrete or any other kind of masonry surface, it's, I recommend using a masonry conditioner. Um, and then just the basic coat of white lotion paint works to provide that kind of neutral base. If your mural is, the majority of it is one specific color, then I you can use that color as a primer. Um, but I like to use just 100% acrylic primer sealer. Um, but depending on what the surface is, if you're painting on metal, if you're painting on wood, uh, look at what the primer, um, like contact your local hardware store and they might have... Um, or any architectural um, um, lead that you might have might be able to help you with what, what to use. So this is just an example of that wall. It was this perfect the kind of cinder block wall, primed already and gridded already. Um, I like to bring my checklist. I have checklists for everything so I don't forget anything. So confirm before you're moving on, all right, to painting the project, confirm your scope, your budget and materials for the project. Ensure that funding is in place and determine your pay schedule. Create that timeline, uh, assess conservation needs, make sure you have any permit that you need, any city things that you need, make sure that you are abiding by the law and you, have, you follow all those regulations. You have the signed contract, from the wall owner or property owner, you have your liability insurance, um, that you purchase materials and arrange for equipment hire, and that you decide which method you're gonna be using to put the images on the wall, which is my next step. 